Welcome to today's Battle of the Books um, event held by UNSW's Allen's Hub. Uh, before we get into things, I just want to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I am currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay my respects um, to their elders past, present and future. So as I said, welcome to this Battle of the Books events. We are incredibly fortunate to have three authors with us today to um, talk about their books. We have Professor Simon Chesterman, um, author of We the Robots, on Regulating Artificial Intelligence and the Limits of the Law. And we have Michael and Lyria, authors of Artificial Intelligence, Robots and the Law. And um, it's fair to say that while the authors agree on some things, they don't agree on everything, having read had the pleasure of reading both of these books. Um, now, we're not going to do any academic throat clearing introductions. All three of our um, panellists today are far too um, important to need introduction and far too well known to need introduction. So I'm just going to jump straight into the, the questions. And I will invite the rest of you to jump straight into questions as well. Uh, we have the chat, of course, where you can put questions. I've got a few of my own, but um, we've left plenty of time, I hope, to have a discussion of things that you might raise. So to jump straight to things, um, Simon, I'm going to start with you and ask you to tell us about the core message of your book. Thanks, Kim, and thanks to Lyria and Michael for uh, for helping organise this. And I should emphasise, everyone must buy both books. Uh, this is not a <laughs> winner-takes-all battle. Um, but as, as you highlighted, we've got slightly different takes. So my own work, I, I think I was working on my book the same time that Lyria and Michael were working on theirs. And in some ways, there are similar things that we're trying to do. But I'll focus what I was trying to do which is, I suppose, come at it from two directions. One direction is my own background in public international law, public authority. Um, the key obvious question that arises with technology that has the potential to offer enormous benefits uh, is how to make sure that societies around the world get the benefit of that technology while mitigate, minimizing or mitigating risk. Uh, and so what I was trying to do is look at, from the perspective of a regulator, how should we think about regulating this new technology? Uh, and so the key message, if you like, is that I think in the literature, there's a tendency to focus on two extremes, either the extreme of narrowly trying to regulate a specific technology. Uh, so there's a lot of work on autonomous vehicles and so on and trolley problems and things like that. Or there's this kind of other extreme of regulating the super intelligence or, or what happens if and when we humans are surpassed by our machines. Uh, and between those, I thought there was a lot of space to do some interesting work. And so hopefully the, the book is useful at diagnosing some of the problems and offering some of the potential solutions. Uh, and very briefly, in terms of the diagnosis of the problem, I break it up in terms of the, the speed, the autonomy and the opacity of these uh, new technologies uh, that are stretching, but not necessarily breaking our existing regulatory models uh, and then try and think through, OK, well, how can and should we regulate these new technologies insofar as new things are needed? Uh, and there, I, I try to break up the problem in a different way, not in terms of the diagnosis, but understanding why we're trying to regulate. Uh, because in some circumstances, all we want to do is mitigate risk. We just want to make sure that things are safe. There is a kind of utilitarian calculus. But in other areas, uh, even if the machines were optimized, even if they were more effective than, than humans, there are some things that we don't want to optimize, some things we're not just focused on harm minimization, some areas where there are, I think there should really be some red lines that should not be crossed. Uh, and then a third category is to look at um, what I think is probably one of the fastest moving areas here, which is the relationship between government and technology. Uh, and there I suggest some limitations on what governments should be outsourcing uh, to machines in the same way that they shouldn't be outsourcing them to anyone else. Thank you so much for that. Um, 
there are so many things I want to pick up on, and I will. Um, I definitely want to come back to that idea of red lines, because I've had a few debates with Lyria about red lines. But first, um, I want to give Michael a chance to um, tell us about the core message of his and Lyria's book. Thanks, Kim, um, and thanks, Simon. Well, um, Lyria and I started writing this in 2019, which seems like a lifetime ago <laughs> now. Um, and we... Um, uh, I was developing a unit up here teaching undergrad students and I wanted a book that sort of distilled all of the the literature that I could or that I was using and that I could use um, in, in the unit and bring it all together. So ours is a sort of uh, combination book of a, a range of different uh, legal and regulatory responses. And we set out to sort of list some of the harms and Sort of the physical and economic and social harms that that AI can, uh, can and does create, um, and then see how the law does respond, um, see where it works and where it doesn't, where we found that it doesn't, to suggest some sort of regulatory response. Um, and so we tried as much as possible to avoid the hype that was surrounding AI. It's, it's, it's dying down a little now, but it's, there's still a lot of hype around it. Um, and everyone's heard the calls for uh, a range of stakeholders to, um, to join this discussion, to, to join together. So philosophers and sociologists join with technologists and engineers. And we set out to sort of set a framework or a common language for everyone to to be able to to use and so we 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 had a stab at some definitions for ai for algorithms big data machine learning computer vision uh, natural language processing and and other other things like robotics um, and so we set the scene for what ai is and how it works and how it doesn't work uh, and we also got into the weeds of the machine learning so uh, the processes and Lair and Ohm's article on this was was quite um, instructive. Um, the eight stages of machine learning before the models uh, let out into the world, and why lawyers should be uh, should be cognizant or aware of those those steps and to start to question them. Um, but the core message of the book. Um, is that all of these things are nuanced. All of these things, uh, a lot of these things are contested. A lot of these definitions are contested. Uh, a lot of the ideas are contested. Um, and that, that there are a multitude of different applications of perhaps the same technology that will require a different regulatory solution. So, for instance, um, a, a, a computer vision uh, system that that uses a, a, um, a, a system that identifies weeds in, in agriculture um, is different to a computer vision system that identifies criminals in a, in, a, um, in a face recognition system. And so you can't have a computer vision regulation that, that works for both of those. There has to be some sort of you know, nuance, even in the regulatory response to the same application. And so we tried to sort of distill all of those nuances uh, in the book. Um, so we hope it provides some greater clarity for, for readers. I do love the, um, yeah, the, the discussion of some of that nuance and the, the importance of context. Mm. Having thought about the computer vision thing, specifically in relation to trademarks, for example, it's... Um, it's different in that space, again, from facial recognition or the like. Um, and now I'm going to make you be all unnuanced for a minute and just ask um, Lyria first, if you did have to nominate, say, just one or two aspects of AI systems or robots that actually do require a legal response as a priority, what would you nominate? So I think um, 
and, and you know, there's many things and the book has many chapters, but I think if I had to pick one, it would actually be um, the relationship between discrimination law and the conversations happening um, in computer science um, and in, in sociology and, and elsewhere around how to design systems that avoid what, what sometimes gets called unwanted algorithmic bias. In other words, there's a poor fit here between what we want organisations to be doing which is often actually keeping all the variables there and then measuring and understanding differential impact of systems on different groups. So is it working effectively when applied to men versus women or people with a disability versus able people, whatever it might be. So to keep track, what we want people to do is to keep track of all the variables right? Um, and then to assess a system by reference to how it works effectively on different groups, if it's making decisions about those groups or assisting those groups or, or whatever it might be doing, and what discrimination law and where that places the legal obligation, which often assumes a human. So the way discrimination law works is the best thing to do is if you like to be blind, right? It's, it's almost like those musician, um, you know, where, where you apply for an orchestra. If you can avoid, um, you know, thinking about gender, race, whatever it might be, um, then you've sort of got an answer to the questions of, of the discrimination law puts on you. But for computer systems, for AI systems, that's not really the way to get to the best answer. So my view is we need to link together what's happening in terms of the discussion around ethics, what's happening in terms of the discussion on technical standards and unwanted bias and how that's being treated in technical standards and bring those together with a sort of legal conversation around what should discrimination law prohibit and what should it encourage. And I love the way that you've steered that straight back to nuance, because one of the things that I really like about that answer and about the discussion in the book too is, you know, what you're looking for is how the technology actually doesn't um, or has shifted the nature of what's going on that the law is trying to regulate. And it's only where there is a genuine shift there that it makes sense to start thinking about how you can change the law. Um, Simon, what about you? Is there an area or a couple of areas where you think we need to prioritise legal response? Sure. Um, maybe, maybe just a, a footnote of, uh, responding to Lyria. Um, I think she really highlights one of the difficulties in regulating AI in that one of the great things about AI systems, about computers, is if you ask them if they're biased, they will try and tell you the truth in a way that humans won't. Uh, and so one of the benefits of operating through AI systems is you can interrogate bias and you can do these kind of very um, counterfactual analyses in a way that you can't with a human. I mean, a human, if you say, well, did you make this decision based on gender discrimination? Virtually no humans can say, yeah, actually I did. Uh, whereas the AI systems allow for a degree of, of um, interrogation that's not possible with a human. And indeed, there's a lively debate whether there is in fact a danger that we hold AI systems to too high a standard uh, if we hold them to a higher standard than human. But you, you wanted a, a, a low hanging fruit, as it were, for quick regulation. And I'll give you an easy one, particularly given my background in public international law. Maybe it's not surprising. Lethal autonomous weapon systems. Um, I, I think that, to me at least, is a pretty clear red line that we should not cross, handing over discrimination, discriminatory power to yeah. AI systems to determine who is a target in what circumstances. Now, this is not to say that we don't have automatic weapon systems. We already have things like landmines. We have heat-seeking missiles that will exercise some degree of automaticity. But the idea that it is possible to delegate that power of discrimination of choosing who is a target in a complex environment, I don't think should be handed over to a machine. And I think that that should be illegal uh, at international law. It should be illegal not just to deploy these weapons, it should be illegal to develop them. And it's important to explain why. The reason is not, as some people fear, uh, that these machines are going to be more dangerous than humans. It's entirely possible these machines, these sort of killer robots, as they're sometimes called, will be more compliant with the laws of war than humans, but we still shouldn't develop them uh, because for two reasons. One is um, the decision should be grappled with. It should be a hard decision. It should be a moral entity like a human that grapples with it, that agonizes over that decision. And also that if the decision that is made is the wrong one, then you should be able to hold a human to account. 
Now, the problem with this is uh, there's already some evidence that um, the equivalent of lethal autonomous weapon systems, drones uh, operating with a degree of autonomy have already been deployed in uh, Libya in 2020. Uh, but uh, if asked for a line that we should draw, I, I still would say that that's the line. That's yeah, uh, th thank you for that suggestion. There is one thing I just wanted to follow up on uh, in, in something you said before, which is that you, you suggested that there was a risk that we might hold autonomous systems or AI systems to a higher standard than we do of humans. Um, but you characterise that as a danger. And I'm wondering why, why that would be a danger and why we shouldn't just hold them to the highest possible standard. Um, I'm, OK, good question. I'm mainly highlighting as a danger analytically um, that we expect AI systems, quite rightly, to be held to a high standard. We've got the opportunity to interrogate them. The, the challenge, I think, is if that unnecessarily constrains innovation. And this, this, if you like, is one of the other. It's a question implicit in what you've been asking up until now, which is not the sort of what regulations do we need? How do we regulate? But or why we regulate, but rather when, when to regulate. Um, and so if we unnecessarily constrain innovation by raising the costs of AI systems uh, to the point where it's prohibitive, uh, then that might, for example, serve the purpose of preserving some human jobs. Uh, and that might be a valuable thing that, uh, that we regard as worthwhile, uh, but that should be a conscious choice. Now, I'm not going down the path of say, Ryan Abbott, who's another author in this area, he actually argues um, that you shouldn't hold AI systems to a high standard. The extreme version, maybe Ryan Carlo about a decade ago saying, look, the only way AI systems will be developed is if we give AI developers immunity um, so they can do whatever they want. I, I don't accept either of those. Uh, but I, I do think that um, we, we need to go in with our eyes open in terms of uh, why we are holding AI systems to a standard that we are either unable or unwilling to hold humans. Um, and if the result is that we constrain AI, de AI development, that should be a conscious choice. For example, in the area of transparency, one of the arguments I make is that certain, certain decisions, we really don't care how they're made. We really don't care um, what the basis of a particular um, decision is as long as it's optimal. I don't care how a calculator works as long as it gives me the correct answer. Uh, but if, for example, you were talking about a judge making a decision about who gets custody of a child, you really do need to understand how that's being, how that decision is being taken. Now, the cost of transparency, at least in the kind of machine learning systems that Michael was referring to earlier, uh, the cost of transparency might be a, a lowering of accuracy. Uh, and in some circumstances, that is a, that is a trade off worth making. So that, that, if you like, was the larger point I was referring to. No, I think that's really helpful. Um, and thank you for that. And I notice um, Philip saying in the discussion, the other the other risk of holding um, AI to a higher standard is that you might actually prevent yourself from deploying a system that will improve things on where you are with the humans. Um, now, that's not always, again, that's not always going to be true, but at least if we're transparent about it, so to speak, if we if we go in, as you say, with your eyes open, at least we can make that judgment. Yeah, um, Michael, so just, just to respond, yeah. one, one thing we're looking at here at AI Singapore is human machine interaction. And there are quite distinct problems where sometimes consumers don't trust AI systems because they're wary they'll make mistakes or it will be evil or something. In an employment context, often workers don't, tr don't trust AI systems because they're worried they'll be too good and will take the worker's job. the relationship between people and computers is not uncomplicated. Um, Michael, I should give you a chance to respond as well to my to my earlier question, which is if you had to nominate a priority area for legal response, what would what would you suggest? Um, well, I, I'm going to adopt um, Woody Hartzog and Evan Salinger's pet topic of um, face recognition. Um, and um, I think as a as an AI system, the EU has proposed in their proposed um, regulation of AI has set out some high risk areas, and they say, you know, let's call high risk areas use of AI systems such as face recognition in biometric identification, in education and vocational training, like in our um, home in our proctoring systems, uh, employment 
uh, including worker um, worker management um, and law enforcement and administration of justice. And all of those topics are really hot topics when we start to talk about um, biometric data and, and keeping a, a permanent record of our of our faces. And so then again, we have to distinguish between government uses, what Simon mentioned earlier, government use of this. Um, and you see in some states in the US where a number of states have banned government use of facial recognition systems. And then uh, commercial use of this where money is the incentive, making money. And we saw a couple of weeks ago, the, the Scottish school kids uh, lining up for their um, lunch being subject to a facial recognition system um, that recognized their order and the the you know the justification was fast through point at the point of sale um, that sort of management sort of efficiency speak which um, which we should all be afraid of um, so when money becomes the incentive it's another set of problems government use one set of problems uh, private use another set of problems so i think facial recognition systems i think we should just halt just pull back and just let's see what's happening before we race into this well there's a direct invitation to people who might take a different view to get into the chat as well um because that, that you know that's a that's a strong position but it's one that has some support good um can i can I turn to a slightly different question because it's starting to come up in the chat, the question of definitions and um, technology neutrality or technology agnosticism versus like trying to regulate new technologies. Um, you know, this is a perennial debate in this area. Do we need tailored regulation for new technologies or do we aim for something more technology neutral? Simon, what's your response to that debate? Yeah, I mean, I, I adopt a pretty broad definition of AI as a basket of technologies. Um, I think most of us, for the purpose of this conversation, are focusing on so-called narrow artificial intelligence. We're talking about machines that can do things that uh, cognitive functions normally performed by a human. Now, um, that's a pretty broad remit. And one of the dangers with the general legislation, uh, and we see this with the EU, is arguably it encompasses almost all computer programs and potentially devices like calculators, uh, which seems kind of crazy. Uh, and so in terms of regulation, I mean, my own preference is to focus, uh, is, is to really think of it at three levels, that obviously there'll be a degree of self-regulation, the adoption of standards, uh, and you need sort of interoperability. Most of the heavy lifting will be done at state level, uh, and different states will take different positions. So Michael's point about Facial recognition, the European Union has adopted one position, similar to San Francisco and a few other small jurisdictions. China, pretty obviously, going in a different direction. Um, and so what I think we need on top of that is a layer, at least a very, very thin layer of international regulation, at least coordination um, in terms of the standards. Uh, but if any red lines are actually going to be policed, then they have to be done at the international level because otherwise there'll be a kind of regulatory race to the bottom. Now, I'm just waiting in the chat for people to say, ah, that's sort of naive, unrealistic. But if you're thinking about the kind of weaponization of AI, there are plenty of examples of where states have collaborated to uh, outlaw specific technologies that are just regarded as too dangerous. Uh, and so you have examples like nuclear weapons, chemical, biological weapons. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think we need sort of a general regulation of, of artificial intelligence in the same way that I think the category of artificial intelligence uh, for the purposes of legal personality is incoherent. Uh, what we do want to do, I suspect, or rather I argue, is have some specific red lines we want to regulate uh, and then sort of cultivate interoperability and, and technical standards uh, across uh, a wider set of technologies. That's one of the um one of the really interesting parts of your book actually was for me was actually reading about your analogies to the IAEA and um, thinking about you know, the regulation of nuclear weapons as as a model potentially for and, and nuclear technology, I should say, as a potential model for thinking about this area. Um, Lyria, your response on that question of technology specific versus technology agnostic. 
Okay, so so my position would be that where the particular technology is what you're concerned about, then you want it to be technology specific. And I think um, very helpfully, um, Simon and Michael have actually covered the two examples I was going to use here. So one is lethal autonomous weapons, where the problem is the lethality of the autonomous weapon, and the uh, uh, you know that is the problem. Um, I mean, what much as I'd love to ban war more holistically, um, not, not that that would be a bit um, pie in the sky. And similarly, um, in the context of facial recognition, and the only thing I might play on Michael's example there is to say, well, what is the technology that you'd actually look at regulating specifically? Is it actually facial recognition? Is it many to one facial recognition? In other words, I can open my iPhone with my face. Do we are we as worried about that as we are about scanning crowds and telling you know saying who's at the political protest? Um, and then are we worried about facial recognition or are we worried about biometrics more broadly? So there might be a number of games we can play and sort of think about to work out, okay, what is the actual technology that we're concerned about and how do we describe that in order to sort of craft the definition um, correctly? Now, my point, I think, um, is that I, I'm not sure there's any circumstance I can think of or that anyone's argued before me where AI is the right category. And part of that is definitional. And I've been having a conversation with Philip RG in the chat. Um, and, you know, he said, well, you know, you know, should we have this sort of, you know, particular, you know, registered person for every system? Well, then how do you define AI? OK, maybe it's autonomously. Interestingly, the OECD definition makes autonomy an orthogonal to the definition of AI in the sense it says that AI systems can operate with varying levels of autonomy. So it's not autonomousness that determines whether something's AI or not, at least for the OECD. Now, the, the, the point I'm making from all of that is, is there a definition of AI, whether it's that sort of high level definition about has same sort of intelligence to humans, whether it is a more sort of as a set of things like the, the OECD does about what the, what the system does, or is it something else entirely that would make that the thing that needs to be specifically regulated? And I certainly think looking at the European regulation, the kind of things it's trying to do, hinging it to AI systems looks to me artificial because a lot of the things it's trying to do about subliminal advertising, you know, I think a subliminal advertising is a bad idea. I don't care if it's an AI system behind it or an evil human sitting, you know, behind a curtain. Um, I, I just think we should, you know, that's the top, you know. So, so let's think about what it is we're trying to actually prohibit. Now, at the at a broader level, I do think AI is an important thing to think about. So I, I think AI is a useful topic. I'm not saying let's not ask the questions and we can go in the direction of discrimination law like I did earlier or a variety of others. Um, but I am, I suppose, concerned that we don't make a regulatory category out of something that we can't define, or even if we can define and, and we can come up with different definitions, that it isn't actually that that's the problem. It's something else. And, and you know, going off the conversation with Philip, maybe it's things acting with autonomy in certain domains or, or something like that. But there might be different definitions for different contexts where we say that's the thing that needs to be regulated. Maybe just two two points in response. First, on the subliminal advertising. Obviously, I agree with that, but everyone should buy our books. <laughs> um, the, um, on, on, on the category, I, I do actually think there is an argument projecting forward into the future, the sort of thing that used to be really science fiction. This is another book. Um, but the, the prospect of an uncontrollable or uncontainable AI system which at the moment remains science fiction, I do think there is an argument that as that becomes more realistic, uh, then that might be a category of things that we want to outlaw, um, the uncontrollable or uncontainable synthetic intelligent systems capable of sort of um, operating beyond our, our, any constraint that we might put in place. But that, that, is, that, that used to be complete science fiction, uh, and now it's kind of made its way into uh, the literature, I think it's a, it's a small part of Lyria and Michael's book. It's a fraction of my book. Um, and I think it does need to be, there needs to be a kind of watching brief on that for the, for the foreseeable future. This is great, and I don't know which point to pick up on first, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first poke at Lyria a little. I mean, because you say, oh, we need to focus on what we're trying to regulate. But, you know, the... <laughs> One of the potential risks of that is you do then end up with, you know, a, a kind of belief almost that, you know, AI isn't regulated because 
we're not talking about regulating AI anymore. We're talking about regulating this behaviour or that behaviour or the other behaviour. You know, in the same way that, you know, I know Kobe Lyons has pointed out that, you know, people thought there was no Australian cyber law because we didn't have an act that said the Australian Cyber Act or the Australian Cyber Security Act. And I'm wondering if there's a risk in your approach that, you know, people will almost think there isn't there isn't regulation of the technology and that might either cause people to go nuts and, you know, Wild West or from a public perspective, kind of under, undermine trust that they don't think it is in fact being regulated properly. Um, I think we I might sort of distinguish two different things. So I, I want to distinguish, I suppose, regulation and and the way that focuses on things from from governance. So I definitely think you know if you're if you're you know if you're operating an AI system, particularly in a domain where you know that that might cause certain harms to people and so forth, you need to have good governance as an organisation and and it, it, to be trustworthy, you need to be able to demonstrate that your system meets particular requirements in the context of what it's doing. So that might be, for example, in the context of you know treating people differently based on their race or gender. It might be in a different kind of context that the system system will, you know, smash into people and, and kill them. Um, it, you know, it, it, it can be all sorts of different things, but trustworthiness ultimately comes from, from there. And I do think that, that you do need governance of AI systems, which is a slightly different point. In terms of government, I, I mean, Kobe and I, in a conversation about the cybersecurity challenge, came up with the cyber law map, which was the idea was to plot out what it is. And I do think government has that responsibility. So if in other words, if people, are, if citizens ask the question, how are you regulating AI? They need to be able to give an answer and say, look, we've looked at the kinds of risks that are generated and where people's concerns are. And here's how we've dealt with the safety issues. Here's how we've dealt with the discrimination issues and so forth and be able to answer that. Um, and, and I don't think you need to make the mistake of crafting a regulation to deal with a specific technology, or what I would say is often a mistake, um, in order to have that sort of, I know the word explainability is used, it's being used in the chat for a very different thing, but in order to be able to explain how you're managing a set of, of risks or concerns or, or, um, or harms, yeah. That yep. leads on terrifically to the next point, which um, is this question of whether we need new governance institutions or regulators, right? Either domestically or internationally in this space of AI. So, um, Michael, I'll turn to you first. Do we need new governance, new regulators or not? Uh, look, I think taking up Lyria and Simon's points, um, I think there does need to be an overarching international level of governance um but as simon pointed out a very thin level and I, perhaps uh uncitral could be a, a sort of a model or some sort of united nations um uh, uh model rule or something that that can be adopted um on this could be a sort of an overarching thing the eu proposal has a has a proposed overarching EU AI board, which would sort of cooperate uh, among nations. The ACCC has, um, has its own digital platforms uh, body. Um, so there are examples. R Ryan Kahlo, um suggested years ago a um, robotics federation or something along those lines. Um, so there does need to be a coordinating, I think, body, which, which sort of uh, oversees uh, and and coordinates uh, um, responses. So yeah, at both a national and an international level. Go on, Simon. Do you have um, a response? Yeah. So so I, I think the the governance challenge of AI uh, operates at a, a couple of levels. And one, just echoing to some extent what Lyria was saying, that the danger with a category. Uh, of AI regulation is you make it, you, you, you give the impression that this is something different from normal legal activity, where I think one of the key messages of both books is that the fact that you're doing something through an AI system doesn't give you any kind of immunity from the regular law. Uh, and that most of the legal questions are not, oh, how does the law apply to this entirely new entity? It's how does law adapt to the fact that we humans and corporations are operating through machines? Uh, and there are some new challenges, but many of most, it'd be interesting to, to quantify, but I would definitely say most of the legal challenges 
uh, questions of application rather than the need for, for new laws. But given the global nature of technology, yeah, what do we do at the, at the global level? What do we do in terms of governance institutions? And I'll give you um, a couple of possible examples. Um, riffing on what Michael was saying, clearly the European Union is hoping for a kind of Brussels effect, like what we saw with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and before it, the Data Protection Directive, you have European standards going at least around significant parts of the world. Um, I'm not convinced that will happen here in particular. I, I can't imagine uh, countries around the world saying, oh, the EU has banned real-time biometric surveillance, therefore we're going to have to delete all of our facial scans. Some companies might make that decision the way Facebook at least claims to be doing so, Meta claims to be doing so now. Uh, but if you are going to have some kind of coordination, I'll give you two examples of where it might be useful. Um, the first, and you touched on this very kindly earlier, Kim, is the uh, the idea of some kind of international body. Uh, and I've posited the IAEA. And the reason for that is to try and sort of openly embrace the dilemma of this new technology where I see at least echoes with nuclear energy back in the 1940s, where there were scientists who recognized, OK, this technology has huge potential for benefit and also for c catastrophic risk. So how do we spread the benefits worldwide while minimizing the risk? And the idea of the IAEA was that you would share nuclear technology for the purposes of energy, medicine, and agriculture in exchange for a commitment not to weaponize that technology. Now, Clearly, it's idealistic. Clearly, the analogy is incomplete. But it is kind of amazing that 70 plus years later, we haven't had any more nuclear bombs detonated. And this 1940s technology is limited to a handful of countries. So that's one level. Uh, and then at the national level, not sort of AI governance, but something I'm increasingly taken with is the idea of a kind of AI ombudsperson, some roving entity whose job is not to sort of define and regulate all of AI, but rather to go and look for the problems, go and, and scope out where it is that there is discriminatory practice, where there is sort of inappropriate outsourcing, where there's a lack of accountability, lack of transparency, and that kind of roving government entity with a degree of independence, I think would be a useful addition to some of the other things that we've been discussing. I think that's really interesting. Um, I see that uh, Robert Chalmers has raised a question in the chat just as you were talking about the fact that verification measures on AI would be more difficult than with something like atomic tech. Did you have a response to that? Yeah, no, and Robert's completely right. I mean, the, the nuclear technology is um, it's pretty complicated. There's a limited set of materials that's unevenly distributed around the world, and it's reasonably easy to track. AI will be none of these things. But I mean, chemical weapons are not that complicated to make, uh, but when Syria uses them, there's international outrage uh, and calls for war crimes. Uh, and you could you could imagine that happening in the context of autonomous AI systems. Um, the problem is it'll be even easier, but that's also a problem with sort of terrorist possibilities of using chemical biological weapons. So you need to have sort of restrictions on dual use technology. Uh, I'm not saying it'd be easy, uh, but I am saying I think it's desirable. Can I press you just on one more thing, which is when you talked about the IAEA example, you, you referred to lethal autonomous weapons, and that's, um, that's you know, an obvious kind of red line that people have talked about. But you also talked about, you know, uncontrollable or uncontainable AI, and you referred to that earlier in this discussion. And I'm just wondering if you can kind of tell us what that looks like. I mean, is are we talking about artificial general intelligence there? Is that the line between something that is uncontrollable or uncontainable and something that isn't? Because sometimes it feels like some of the technology currently is pretty uncont uncontained and very difficult to contain. Yeah, I mean, and there are plenty of examples of computer viruses that are essentially un uncontained. Um, the, I mean, I'm trying to keep an open mind about what artificial general intelligence might look like. Uh, because I think the, the the problem with the the way in which science fiction has conditioned our way of thinking about this is that most of us tend to think like of, of sort of Isaac Asimov style, humanoid shaped human level intelligence or slightly smarter than humans or Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator style. This idea of something in human form and approximately human level intelligence when at least the literature I've read and the people I've spoken to suggest that if we ever get a machine to 
general dog level intelligence, it could very quickly go vastly past humans. And there's no reason to think that it would be uh, embodied in human form. I mean, when, when we started designing uh, self-driving vehicles, I don't think anyone seriously said, right, what we need is a humanoid robot that will hold onto the wheels with artificial hands and press the, the pedals with artificial feet. Um, so I'm trying to guard against the sort of unknown unknowns. Uh, and so as I argue in the book, um, I don't think now is the time to outlaw research. Uh, but there are examples of where we have outlawed research in the past, and I draw comparisons with things like genetic technology, um, that I think, like cloning of human embryos, uh, most people around the world think, okay, that's a line we shouldn't cross, even though the technology to do that is is not widely available, but it's, it's pretty accessible. Um, and so it's that sort of level of, of a watching brief that as the possibility of artificial general intelligence becomes more realistic, if it becomes more realistic, and that's not clear that's on the immediate horizon, but if there is a kind of pathway people start mapping out, then that's what we would have wanted to ban, I, I at least argue, or go into with our eyes open. And, and the last thing I'll, I'll say on that is that, um, the, the, because the problem is if you start developing these things, and this is where Bostrom and others I think are quite interesting, if you do get to the point of developing an artificial general intelligence and you say, ha but we will control it or contain it, there is a real danger that in doing so, you create the threat that you're trying to avoid. Because one of the first things that any kind of quasi sentient entity would conclude is that it doesn't want to be constrained by its makers. Indeed, um, as the movies keep telling us. Um, something else that's come up in the chat already is this question of ex explanations and explainability. And so I, I will raise this. So the Human Rights Commission, obviously, the Australian Human Rights Commission had a lot to say about the con concept of a right to an explanation. Um, and I'm wondering what you all think. Should there be a right to an explanation for adverse decisions? Lyria, I'll, I'll go to you first. Okay, so I think um, if you think about this, I think again uh, it's worth reflecting on where this sits in the context of the existing law. And and I, I we don't certainly don't want to be worse off than we are now. If decisions are made by machines, we don't want to lose something by way of where we do have a right to an explanation. And there may be circumstances in which we can actually be better off, where certain kinds of decisions, um, you know, we get better or clearer explanations for. But I think it's important to recognise that we don't actually have some kind of general right to explanations for decisions that get made even where they deeply affect us. Um, you know, if, for example, a school's decision not to take a particular child in as a student, I think everyone in Sydney can, you know, you know I mean, if the public schools have to, you know, have areas, the private schools, it's a free for all. Um, you know, decisions about, um, you know, if someone created a perfect match dating system um, and, you know, it, it, you know, th there would be no requirement that it has to tell people why they're matched. It could market itself as doing so or not doing so, right? But it would change what is marketed. But there's no general rule that, you know, if I choose to date someone or not date someone, that I have to give people I reject an explanation. I might do so because I'm polite, but I don't have to, right? Um, so we don't, we, you know, decisions can affect us even in quite profound ways and we don't get a right to an explanation. We do have a right to explanations in very particular contexts. So we have a right to an explanation, for example, when governments make decisions that affect us, right? So that's an administrative law sort of right to reasons kind of right. And we have rights to explanations from government more broadly. You know, we, 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 we you know, ultimately there, you know, that they have to sort of justify their policies to a certain extent and there's freedom of information laws or we can try to understand some of the reasoning behind things. But that's a very different kind of right to when decisions affect us specifically. Um, if we're in litigation with another party about, you know, they, I claim that they, um, you know, fired me illegitimately or whatever, then maybe I can get an explanation through that litigation about the reason why they made that particular decision, um, or at least their silence might be construed against them in particular ways. So we, we have to sort of think about this in the sort of non-AI world first. Then, as I said, we have to go back and make sure that where we are entitled to an explanation, that that's not something that gets lost simply because government doesn't use a human but uses an AI system. Um, and as I said, we might even be able to make those explanations better. But then the real question comes down to less about a right to an explanation, not a right to an explanation, there's some sort of abstract thing in the world, and more about the how. Where it's how do we know two things about we want 
if we're going to have an explanation come from an AI system in a context where we do want to say that is required. One is, um, you know, in what, what kind of form does it take? Do we want a counterfactual? You know, had you turned up to work on time, we wouldn't have sacked you, right? So, so do we want that kind of an explanation? Do we want an explanation that sort of broader sort of statistical type explanation like these variables um, in your case are, are linked with the decision that was made? Um, you know, do we want some other kind? Of, so we can think about these as types and actually think about which kind of explanations we want in different contexts and what might be enough, you know, what is actually required from the system, say for an administrative decision, you know, what would be enough to be as good as what people can expect from a government human making that decision. But the second important thing we really want is for lack of a better word, reliability measures. So we already know with humans um, that they can lie, right? Maybe they made a decision um, on race or gender or whatever, but they're not going to admit that. That's already come up, right? They're going to say, oh, it's because you're not as experienced or they'll come up with some other reason. Um, and that could be a direct lie. And it could be just that they don't really know their own reasons, right? Maybe it's subconscious, um, the, the real reason that explains their decision. But here's where I do think we can be more demanding in terms of the explanations from machines in situations where that explanation is required. So I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about saying there should be some open right to an explanation that we can say, for example, that it has to be reliable to a certain extent, right? They can, and, and this isn't going to be best done. All of these questions, the how of the explanations, the reliability tests and so forth is not best done by politicians trying to draft some right to an explanation act. Um, you know, and, and Europe has tried this in Article 22 of the GDPR, and I don't think they did a terribly good job of it. But, you know, that's not going to be the best place to go. The best place to go is going to actually be something like a technical standard, right, where you actually say, um, you know, this is what this is what this kind of explanation, this is how you can generate it, this is the testing you can do on it to make sure it's sufficient and so forth, et cetera. And you can tweak that over time as you get different kinds of systems, because maybe the explanations that can be generated by one kind of machine learning um, system um, can't, you know, it's a very different kind of explanation you want from a different kind of machine learning. So you can get down to that sort of fine grained, what's appropriate in the circumstances question, um, much better that way. Um, and so I just summing up, I suppose, overall, no freestanding right to an explanation, but certainly not losing existing right to an explanation, maybe adding them in a few extra places where we think through actually, if it's a human giving the explanation, I don't, if it's a human giving the decision, I don't need it, but in this particular context, if it's a machine, I do. So it might be a bit of tweaking on where we need explanations, but much more focus on the how and the, and the testing um, to make sure the explanations that we get are meeting their needs. That is picking up beautifully on a couple of questions I have about the whole explanation thing. One is that we know that some of the explanations that can be generated can be tweaked or massaged. You know, there are technical papers that tell us that basically computers can lie. Sorry, Simon. Um, or that they can be programmed to lie. I mean, we think about the emissions stuff with, was it Volvo? Um, the car Volkswagen. companies. Emissions. Volkswagen. Yeah, Volkswagen. We better not, we better not defame car. the wrong company. <laughs> um, so wrong company. Take it back. Um, the car company that was lying on its, its emissions. Um, so, I, yeah, I, th I think that's um, that's very interesting. And the other thing that I think you were picking up on there is there are circumstances where we might, we might want an explanation, perhaps to give better effect to some rights. So if an explanation means showing us, like, the spread of decisions so that we can identify bias in a way that we couldn't before when humans were making the decision, we could actually give better effect to anti-discrimination law, potentially, than we can when humans are making the decision. So I think that's really interesting. Um, Simon, I should let you respond as well on that question of explanations. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree with much of what Lyria said, except that um, I think and she adverted to this very, very briefly, Article 22 in the GDPR, where one of the problems is that the right to an explanation is often, I think, wrongly understood as only the right to an explanation of an adverse decision, uh, which is a problem because if you believe certain decisions should be transparent, uh, so in particular, let's say focus on government decision making, we want government decision making to be transparent, not just to protect the poor schmuck whose kid doesn't get into a school or individual who doesn't get a benefit, um, but because government decisions need to be legitimate, need, need to be understandable in order to be legitimate uh, in, for the most part, of, well, for much of much of the uh, many of many circumstances. And so if you only have a right to an explanation when a decision goes against you, 
One, you need to know that a decision went against you and you won't always know that. You'll know if you apply for something and you get rejected, but you won't know if you were sort of considered and they're not chosen. Um, but secondly, transparency is of interest. I mean, I have an interest in Michael not having a decision made against him um, that goes beyond his own interest. We all have an interest in government decision making being legitimate. So this is why I would argue that right to an explanation, sure, if that's if that's the way to get leverage on transparency, that's the kind of minimum degree of transparency. Uh, but transparency has to mean much more than that if we're talking about government decisions, uh, because the individuals who have a stake in government decisions are all of us who are contributing to the, the public good uh, and have an interest in how taxes and other things are, are distributed. In terms of actual explanations, an interesting question, again, building on what Liria was saying is, OK, what needs to be explained to whom, when and for what purposes? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and in some situations, it might be as simple as you didn't get this job or this benefit if this thing had been different. Like if you had a different salary, you might have got a different, you might have got a loan. If you had more experience, you might have got the job. Um, that can be useful for the individual. Uh, but often the reason why we want reasons is not necessarily to change the decision, but so that we can accept that we can live with the decision. Um, and here I'm kind of reminded, I'm based in Singapore. Years ago, we had a, a delegation of Australian public servants come over here. Uh, and one of the key points of discussion with the Australians asking the Singaporean counterparts, how do we get people to go online like you guys? Because Singapore really embraces this sort of e-government. And one of the key reasons why it seems Australians are resistant to that uh, is Australians want to be able to yell at a government official. Uh, and so sometimes the reason we want an explanation is not necessarily to change it, but so we can grumble about it, so we can fight it, and then maybe it makes us more likely to live with it. The disturbing thing about that is perhaps it's an argument in favour of more robot-like, more human-like sort of interfaces so that you can have something to yell at <laughs> that isn't just a line of text on a screen. Um, I think that's really, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, can I come back to something else that um, was has been raised a couple of times, which is red lines? You know, are there are there lines that we shouldn't cross? You know, the the one that we've mentioned is you know, lethal autonomous weapons. That's that's almost the easy case. Um, are there, are there ways to draw red lines? How do, how do we go about deciding where the lines are between you know uh, that a automated system should not go beyond? Do you have a good beat on that, Simon, is because I, I know that it's something that you discuss in the book. Well, so I mean, we've, I've talked about this sort of international level, but I mean, I think the market can actually be quite interesting here, and we've seen that to some extent with privacy, uh, and most recently uh, Meta or Facebook's announcement they're they're moving away from facial recognition, which I first noticed when I found gee, it's much harder to tag people in photographs when I was trying to sort of tag a photograph, um, and I think I think market sensibility is going to be an important factor. Uh, and this is where education and trying to get people to think uh, is going to be important. And one challenge here is there tends to be such a, a disconnect between what people say and what they do in areas like privacy. So routinely people will say they care about privacy, for example, but then they'll go about living their digital lives in a way that shows that they clearly don't. Um, so one area in which I think there's probably more research to be done, and it's probably more by the psychologists and people looking at human machine interaction, is what we sometimes refer to as the creepiness factor. Um, and so I've got a colleague who does um, digital development for a bank here in Singapore, and he tells his colleagues, OK, I want you to develop tools that will be helpful to our clients, but not creepy. And it keeps it that vague um, because um, it, it highlights something visceral that many of us have a resistance to. And I think it was Michael who raised earlier a kind of real time um, uh, biometric surveillance, in particular sentiment analysis, um, that I suspect there'll be a lot of interest on the part of companies to be able to sort of interpret our feelings, how engaged we are. We've seen experiments with this even in the classroom, uh, but many of us would regard that as kind of creepy. Uh, and if we can sort of agree on that creepiness level, uh, then you won't have to regulate it because there won't be a market for it. Uh, but I suspect uh, 
uh, it's going to be very hard to get that level of consensus. But that's that's one of the best ways to regulate things is to dissuade companies from developing problematic products in the first place. That is a terrific and fascinating response. Um, Michael, did you or Lyria, did you want to respond to any of that? <laughs> um, I think the point about norms is is um, interesting. You mentioned a market response to um, to the Facebook or Meta um, reaction. I think that was was that a, a a market response? Did the market cry for that? Was or was it people simply objecting to them having too much, just too much of our data and too much of our um, biometric data. Um, is that an ethical concern that they were responding to? It's, it's difficult to uh, imagine Facebook responding to <laughs> ethical concerns. Um, but I think in, I think the only way that things change is when there is a, an outcry or a response. The Scottish school, school children, for instance, went, went global um, and stopped them from implementing that system so they they pulled back facebook's deleted what a billion photos they said but they've got three billion customers <laughs> so they've got multiple billions of of face um identifications um so what they what they have done is just i think what facebook does which is just respond a little bit and hope it blows over while also implementing a new system, the metaverse, which could, you know, strip so much more of our data um, at the same time. So it could be all a smokescreen anyway. Um, so red lines, I think, um, uh, are driven, I guess, from bottom up these days rather than any top down um, implementation so far. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I see the time. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to give a last chance to first Lyria, then Simon, then Michael, just to say anything that you we haven't touched on or that you want to, to emphasise or respond to a question in the chat. Lyria. Uh yeah, no. So I was actually looking at um, um, what, Chris, what Chris Skinner had said in the chat about engineering systems. Um, and that sort of reminded me of another really important point, and it links with Maury's point as well about, you know, what kind of explanation is going to be deeply contextual. The kind of explanation you want from a government decision, um, you know, is, is, you know, how, you know, for, for, even if it's for Simon's reason, just because you want to yell into the void. Um, but, you know, is, is quite different too. If you think about something like going back to autonomous vehicles, the kind of explanation you might want from a vehicle. It's not that you need the vehicle to tell you every time it, ve you know, it veers slightly to the left exactly why it made that decision. But you do want to be able to, say, for example, in the event of a crash, understand, you know, that sort of crash investigation type reporting to understand what went wrong in order to avoid it again and so forth. So it's going to be really detailed and specific. At some, In some circumstances, it can be black boxed. In other words, all you really want to understand is the behaviour of the black box. Um, you know, if, if you drive an automated vehicle, most of the time that's all you want. You want to know it's been safety tested as a black box, not that you know you can you can sort of dive into the system and understand its rationale for everything. So I think I think that's a, just a really important point to bear in mind, and why um, you know this issue needs to be addressed. I think in a in a in 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 a very careful way, rather than talking about sort of rights to explanations as a, as a too high a level. Simon, you have all of about one minute. And apart from buy my book or buy our yes. books, what's yes, the Yes, we'll do the, the, go back to the subliminal advertising again. Um, no, so two quick points uh, in response to uh, to questions. So Biola raised the, that, I mean, I'd love to go to a conference where the, the sole agenda of the conference is to develop a common creepiness standard. That would be a really bizarre conference. Um, and I'm, I'm now going to apply for a grant to, to organise that. <laughs> um, but secondly, um, as is common in these debates, often a lot of what we're really talking about isn't in fact AI. We're talking a lot about data. Uh, and so just to finish off, one, one thing I find fascinating is how we have different approaches to the way in which governments have access to our data and we get very up in arms and very nervous about what governments are going to do with our data. But we're perfectly happy for companies to collect vast amounts of data uh, through our devices.
Uh, and I think that really does pose a, a challenge for regulators that people are quite happy to give all of my locations, Google and Apple and so on, have access to my location real time most of the day. Um, and I'm quite relaxed about that. Uh, but I might be more concerned about giving that information to government when the purpose of government is to safeguard my well-being and provide basic public goods and the purpose of Apple and Microsoft and so on is to make money. Uh, so I think the incentives here are, are a little bit confused. And on the, the, the point uh, that someone raised in the chat, how do we advance this debate? How do we influence people? Well, we're trying to change the way people think. Uh, but yeah, by all means, lobby government, make public arguments, produce policy papers, uh, or get elected and make a difference. And on that note, <laughs> I think Mike, Mike has got the last chat. Yes, no, Mike, Mike, Michael should have the last chance to. Oh, really? Should it? Um, uh, I'm, I'm studying power at the moment, the power of the, the platforms. Um, and how, how is it, Simon, that, that we're perfectly happy to, to let them have all of our data? Um, what have they done to us to make that so, right? What, how, have we, how has it been normalised? Um, and I, I'm looking into that intently at the moment. So um, uh, stand by. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Yes, that's right. The Wizard of Oz was prescient indeed. <laughs> Um, well, I just want to say thank you to our wonderful authors. I have found this a really invigorating and interesting um, talk. Um, and just as invigorating and interesting as indeed the books themselves. Um, I heard some disagreement. I heard plenty of furious agreement too, which seems about right for a good discussion like this one. And thank you too for everyone who came along. There's been some great commentary going on in the chat as well, which I've been drawing on and so have our um, panelists. So thank you everyone. Thank you Alan's Hub for organising and Lyria for organising and inviting me to be part of this. And, thank you um, for chairing, Kim. Uh, you, can, you can never thank yourself, but as, as director of the Allen Hub rather than a mere panellist, thank you so much for coming in and sharing this discussion and also Michael and Simon for participating and everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Lyria. Thank Thanks, you, Simon. Michael. Thanks, Simon. Thanks. That was fun. Yeah, it was good. Yes. Thanks very much. Thank you again, everyone. It was genuinely interesting. And thank you good for fun. You get now, putting is, up is with a drone. A drones arriving with drinks or something? Is that right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish. I wish we'll all have to get together for a drink when when that becomes possible. Although now, Simon, you can actually travel to Australia from Singapore. So I may yet make it in December to go and visit uh, my mother in Melbourne. But uh, yeah, fingers crossed, maybe 2022, I'll come to Sydney or you're all welcome in Singapore. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the creepiness conference. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. Is that yes. a dress up affair? <laughs> <laughs> maybe it should be held on the 31st of October though. That would be... <laughs> yeah. Then we can double up and we can make it really creepy. Yeah, the uncanny valley signs. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank Good to see you. Everyone. Thanks again, Kimberly. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you.